this is not the end of the story. We have the possibility of writing something much more beautiful for our world. My name is Nondombi Naomi Tutu, uh, the Reverend, I guess. Um, I am, at present, I am a priest associate at All Saints Episcopal Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. Yes, I am Archbishop Desmond Tutu's daughter. <laughs> if the nose didn't give it away. Uh, <laughs> I came to the priesthood very late in life. I didn't go to seminary till I was after uh, after my 50th birthday. Um, so I have had a, a, a career as an economist, as a professor, as a race and gender activist, which has been the, the foundation really, has been a race and gender activist throughout everything else that I've done. I was like, that's not going to happen, that's never going to happen. And in fact, the very first time that I, I, I thought I felt a call to ministry, I was 24 years old. And I just was like, no, no, that could not be it. And um, finally, in fact, what it was, was one of my spiritual directors said to me, you keep saying maybe, then backing off. At least take the time to sit down and face it. And maybe you're running from nothing. Maybe there isn't a call. But if you don't face it, you'll never know. And so um, I decided, OK, I'm going to uh, go to divinity school. And I made sure it wasn't seminary, because seminary, you were definitely going to be ordained. But I said, OK, I will go to divinity school. And I was still resting with God and I said you know I'm going to apply to one divinity school and if I don't get in this is clearly not it and I got in and um, and in the process of recognizing as you say that a call to ministry is not necessarily the ordained ministry and I thought maybe in divinity school I'll find a way what is the call that I feel on my life and it became clear around my second year that it was ordained ministry and it was in the Anglican communion. My goodness. Um, so when I got the invitation, I um, I was so excited. I mean, I was so honored and excited. I was um, when Sarajani Siraj, wrote to me. I was, oh my gosh, of all the people that they could have invited around the world, all the people who have been priests who have been in the work with Daddy all these years that they came to me. I was just, uh, I don't know. I it just blew me away. It is a hard moment for me it is a hot moment and an opportunity to to honor my father and to honor the work that continues to be done around the world Well, I think that actually this is the time for those of us in the religious community to really step up. The way that religion has been used as a way to fracture people all over the world, the way that we see in the US where I live, Christian nationalism being used to, to divide people, the way that we see um, Islamophobia being used to say that religions necessarily are at odds with one another, the ways in which we are seeing around the world religions um, pushed into struggle against one another. It is, this is, in fact, if ever there was a time, it is the time for those of us who are faith leaders to step up and to speak out about the ways in which our religions, all of our religions are based on love of our neighbor and that we have to st speak out against the misuse of religion, of faith, as, as foundations for hatred, that none of our faiths were established as places of hate. And any time we allow the voices of hate to take on the cloak of religion, then we have failed. I 
I kind of stole the title because in fact that was the tagline for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. And, um, and, and so I, and I thought that it was a really important tagline that often gets forgotten in the conversation about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that, you know, the whole focus on how do we reconcile? Well, they, they kind of told us that in order to be, for there to be true reconciliation, we have to speak the truth of who we are, what we have done, what we have been through. And I, and, and I want to, in this, in this presentation tonight, um, talk to us about being truthful about our history, about the histories that we each come from, um, truthful about our own roles in our societal ills, and truthful about the power that we each have to change the path of history. One of the things that was the most powerful for me in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which wasn't um, any testimony that was actually given to the commission, it was a letter written to the commission by a young white South African that was read at one of the hearings I got to attend. And he said in his letter, he said, um, you know, I didn't know about the murders. I didn't know about deaths in detention. I didn't know about police in, in black classrooms. I didn't know about um, um, cross-border massacres of South African refugees and other nationals of those countries. I didn't know about the things that my government was doing to my black compatriots. And then he said, and I recognize that part of me chose not to know. And, and that is a truth that he was willing to come to. And I have had so many conversations with white South Africans who have stopped at the I didn't know and have not been willing to go to the, but why didn't you know when people were speaking, when my father was speaking and being vilified, right? And so that for me, the, the, the path to reconciliation is the courage to hear and speak the truth. Ooh, what would be, oh. I, I have a, a kind of a pat answer almost for that, and it comes out of being a black woman, mother of two girls and a, a, a black young man, two young women and a black young man. And for me, a just society is around the world that I view for my children. And so a just society for me would be one in which my daughters would be safe as women whenever they walked, wherever they walked, that there would not be the fear of gender-based violence, that they would be safe in their homes from partner violence, that they would be safe walking in the streets from being accosted and raped, and they would be free in their workplace from sexual harassment. So for me, the and as a, again, race and gender activist, that is, a, a key part of a just society for me. A, a world that embodies God's vision of shalom, a true peace, a peace where all of God's creation can be that creation that God first looked at and said, it is very good. That is a just world. The one thing I would like people to take away is that we each have the power to change our world. And that um, we're not all going to be Nobel Peace Prize winners. We're not all going to be on the world stage. We're not all going to have books written about our lives. But we all have the opportunity to impact someone's life in a positive way. That we all have the opportunity to use our voices, whether it is simply to raise our voice when we see one person being um, diminished or uh, 
dehumanized to say uh, that is not going to happen in my presence. We all have the, the ability when we see somebody lonely, hungry, to, to help feed, to reach out in humanity. That we each have a role in making our world a better place. And our role might never be publicized, but that action, that one person we impact will always remember us and will remember the importance of their, that action on us, even on them, even if they never get to know our name. My, my grandmother used to always say to us, this is not the end of the story. When we would be upset, depressed, feeling down about the reality of apartheid, she would always say, this is not the end of the story. And you have to believe that this is not the end of the story. And this lecture to me speaks to a community that says, this is not the end of the story. And we have a role in writing the correct end to our story, a story that is about a world that is a just world. And what is it that we can do? Maybe this is not all that we can do, but this is a part that we can do, that we can bring together people of diverse thoughts with, with different ideas about how to build a just society, but that will prick our imaginations, um, that will make us think, oh, I hadn't considered that possibility, or oh, I hadn't imagined that my gift could be used in this way that this is what I, I see this lecture, the role that this lecture would have, is to, to let different people in different paths and different communities connect with one another and recognize that our dream of a just world is a dream that is shared by many and that the more voices we hear and the more ways that we can imagine working for justice, the more likely it is that the story will be a wonderful story story. As I was preparing for this presentation, uh, reaching out for the inspiration from my, from those who have gone before me, and, and trying to reach for words from my father and that phrase from my grandmother coming to my mind instead. And, and, and so this, it is not, this is not the end of the story, is for me a, a, a word of encouragement for all of us in working towards a, a, a more just world, to say what we see around us, and I think maybe it is because this time that we are living in feels very much like the 80s under apartheid, the, the, the level of conflict and, and hate mongering that is going on and the words, this is not the end of the story. We have the possibility of writing something much more beautiful for our world.